Hello, my name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image, um, and I welcome you to this uh, amazing talk uh, between uh, the filmmakers Midi Z and Keiji Wu and Jessica Kiang. Uh, this uh, is in honor of the theatrical premiere of, uh, of their film Nina Wu, um, which premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2019, and now thankfully can finally make its way to the US uh, via this sort of virtual cinema release. Um, the film releases this Friday, March 26th and runs for uh, two plus weeks, at least through April 11th, probably beyond that. Um, and there's also gonna be uh, accompanied by a retrospective of Midi Z's films, um, uh, six by, by Midi Z, so including uh, Nina Wu. So I encourage you to check out all of these films um, and to do so through Museum of the Moving Image. Um, and uh, also stay tuned, there'll be a, another talk with Minnie uh, about these other films. So uh, we're not gonna cover that in this conversation. This conversation will be about Nina Wu. Um, and so the, again, the guests we have are the director of and, and co-writer of Nina Wu, Minnie Z, and the co-writer and star of Nina Wu, Keiji Wu. Um, and again, she is going, they're gonna be in conversation with Jessica Kiang. Jessica Kiang is international critic for Variety. She also writes for Sight and Sound and The Playlist. Um, she is uh, one of the smartest, best writers I know. And I'm just incredibly excited that she's here talking to our guests. So take it away, Jessica. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm, I'm going to not be able to live up to that intro. Um, but uh, thankfully, I'm talking to, to, uh, to two people who I'm sure very much will be able to live up to their fantastic introductions. Um, and I want to actually to, to start, um, I'm, I'm hoping that most of the people who will be uh, watching this will have already seen Nina Wu, but for those of you who haven't as well, um, I want to start with a little bit of context, actually. And um, I think that's one of the most important um, uh, aspects of, of Nina Wu um, is actually quite uh, interestingly highlight, highlight by the anecdote of its very first Cannes premiere. Um, I was lucky enough to be there um, at the Cannes press screening in 2019 where it played in the Un Certain Regard sidebar in Cannes. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's unusually enough, it's a screening that I recall very distinctly because it was an unusual um, uh, scenario. For those who don't know, can press screenings tend to be very unglamorous affairs, usually just sweaty, tired journalists. Um, but on this occasion, the film actually started a little late because we were waiting for the arrival of a VIP. So I wonder, Midi, if you can take us through a little bit what your memories of that first screening are, because I know it's a very nerve wracking thing for any filmmaker, um, but also that you had this added um, layer of intrigue almost happening because uh, it was attended by Quentin Tarantino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I ran into Mr. Quentin Tarantino like uh, I think three days before our premiere at another screening, and he just sat like close to me, and he introduced himself to me because he noticed my name on my oh, chair. Yeah. Yeah, he said, oh, you are Midi Z? Because I, I, yeah, he told me he read my news on Variety or what kind of, uh, I, I don't know, magazine. And he noted my story and he asked me if he could uh, attend my screening. Yeah. And okay. then I told him where and when. And then the premiere day, and the guy appears, that's all. <laughs> and after, yeah, yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, after premiere, just one day right after the premiere, we, I ran into him again because we stay at the same hotel. We wake up very early, like 6 or 7 a.m. at the hotel lobby we all were wooden for the breakfast. Mm -hmm. So so Mr. Quentin Tarantino, like, you know, walked to me and I was very nervous, as you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like his film, every kinds of his film. And he told me he likes Nina Wu and he, he expressed every details in the film. He 
relink and connect every plot. And he could specifically uh, told me which part is the illusion, which part is the reality in the film. So I was very surprised. And he, he told me this film remind him David Lynch, Moholland Drive. Yeah, of course. And then he told me this film has too many details. It, it should be watched again and again with different kinds of uh, surprise in the film because there's a lot of hints and details. Yeah, yeah. That's, so I I was, that's, that's mm. entirely <laughs> correct, yes. And I, I mean, I'm really glad to hear that, that uh, he, he seems to have had such a good grasp on it. Yeah, and we exchange some yeah experience yeah about filmmaking. Of course, I asked some questions about his work. Yeah, yeah it's, it's lovely that there was a nice little meeting of minds there. Um, I'm not normally so sort of gossipy and interested in this sort of celebrity <laughs> aspect of it, but I think in this case. Um, it was specifically very interesting to all of the journalists there because it was lost on nobody that your film um, was really at that time in, in, in May of 2019 was very much one of the first films to very directly deal with Me Too issues. Um, and if we can sort of cast our minds back to then, that was like only... That was a year after Harvey Weinstein had been arrested, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. was still a year before, you know, what has happened recently, which is, you know, his, his sentencing, um, his, his uh, conviction and sentencing. So, so we were still in this very sort of tender period, this early mm -hmm. period of, of the Me Too thing. So the reason that I brought up the, the Tarantino thing was because obviously Tarantino has a long-term association with Harvey Weinstein, having him, him having been his producer for so long. So it was something that was very much in people's minds, I think, when, when we saw him uh, showing up there at the, at oh, the premiere. Yeah. Oh. And, um, and Kushi, I would like to ask you, within that context then, um, because th this was all so much part of our minds there, but I, I understand that a lot of the film comes from, is informed by your own personal experiences. Um, so I want us to, to, to ask you about how, how that, that sort of uh, zeitgeist context of the Harvey Weinstein stuff, um, how, it, how it helped or did it, what, what, it, what in it spurred the gestation of the project? Well, it, uh, it was pretty much, uh, it was, uh, you have, okay, I started to write script back, back in 2014 or 15. I think kind of like inspired by Great Arthur Weeks, uh, Frances Ha, and because she was an actress, and then so that was the first time uh, uh, to me that I, I haven't thought of, you know, I can write something to maybe to have my own project or, or to, uh, you know, to, to create something. I was just waiting for projects that time. And then this kind of, you know, female director really inspired me and so I started to write something and then I finished the script uh, before around 2016, but it was the story in, uh, inspired by my own experience. And the story, and the story was about an extra, because I, uh, I was an extra for two years before I started to really making films. And the story was about an extra struggling, you know, trying to become a real actor I finished the script uh, around 2016 and I put it aside because I wasn't confident enough to share anybody. And then back in 2017, when Me Too occurred, I was purely extremely curious about what happened on those women and what happened on each hotel room. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research and I read so many articles and I read a, an article, I, I think in Green Daily about, you know, the rise and fall about Harvey Weinstein and an and early intern of his. And, and I also uh, read about lots of articles from South of Korea at that time. And when, and there, there was an actress who wanted to commit suicide and she has been seeing psychiatrists for 15 years and she just couldn't get it out of it. So I, and those stories really touches me. And then they reminded me of 
my own experience because I because of their story, I started to know that I once had a PTSD experience back when I was an extra. I was a bu uh, verbal bully by uh, a director and a cinematographer, um, but I didn't know what I had was PTSD. So after I know it was PTSD, I, old, I know all the symptoms and then I feel like strongly wanted to write something down to express and to combine their experiences and, and in my own to use the way of editing, you know, and the visual, the, the, the magic of, of film. I feel like I can tell the stories of, you know, how those women or how those victims feel mm -hmm. in their mind when mm -hmm. people are suffering from tra uh, traumatized kind of like illness. It's really chaotic in their mind. Sometimes I feel I'm sitting here talking to you, but sometimes I was drawn back to the day I was bullied once and once again. And it's so hard to tell uh, through, uh, you know, uh, articles. So mm -hmm. I just uh, feel like writing it. And so I started to rewrote my previous script and then turn into Nina Wu. And there's uh, one, one thing interesting that while I was writing, I also saw a video, a YouTube video of uh, Elia Page's coming up classic speech. And mm -hmm. so I also felt very moved by her speech. Uh, so I changed Nina's per, uh, sexuality. For the previous draft, Nina was great, but I just wanted to dedicate this uh, film to people, brave people like Ben. So mm -hmm. I changed uh, Nina's uh, sexuality. Exactly. So that's well, how the story came out. Yeah. I think I think this is. I mean, for me, that's one of the the great strengths of the film is that you have achieved, managed to achieve this very personal, embodied uh, idea of what it is to experience trauma and what it is to experience mental instability in the wake of an extremely traumatic incident, um, and that sort of fragmentation, but. In order to do that, you, the film goes into very surreal, very stylistic territory, um, which it sounds like was kind of already there and your, your, it was your intention already in the script screenplay. So I'm wondering how, wh at what point did you decide that it was, it was it, that Midi Z should be the person who, who, would, who would take this on? Because it's slightly in a different register from the other films of his, many of which you have appeared in. So I know you, you had a pre-existing relationship, but what was it, uh, uh, Kushi, that, that brought you, that, that made you feel confident that he was the guy to be able to, to help you um, to, to bring this very personal and, and uh, potentially very controversial project to life? Um, well, after, I, uh, after my revision of the new uh, drift, uh, I felt very excited because it, there, it, there's a feeling of something new to me that I don't know, I, I feel like there are so many crazy stuff in the script I wrote and just wanna share with somebody else, like you no know, dog, dog barking or face slapping stuff, it's so crazy. But I feel, I feel like, you know, I've done something, finished, I finished it. So I really wanna share with someone and then I, I thought of some director I used to work with, but I, I wanted to, uh, share with me because we worked with uh, so many films and I trusted him and then I and he, I think he's a he's an extremely talented director and he is so good at uh, how to say that when we work on set he usually he, uh, he would have this strong uh, intuition to uh, lead me to explore something that uh, I didn't know before and to make the script even more like uh, avant-garde or something I don't know. So I wanted to share with him. And one thing is that he, I think he, he is very good at portraying female stories. Just like the role I played in The Road to Mendeley is uh, actually it's his uh, sister story. And I think he uh, respects women because he told me that he was raised by his uh, mother and his elder two sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very so good. that's what yeah. I think is pretty, uh, he's suitable for this project. 
And I also feel like one thing that's very important that um, a lot of people ask me in Cannes that why didn't you find a female director to direct this film? But to me, uh, gender equality to me is really like, you know, uh, women for men, men for women, he for her, she for him. Um, we need everybody to get involved with this and to talk about it and then to help each other. It's not something that, oh, I wrote the novel and I dislike men, I wanna, you know, be the enemy of, no, it's not like that. It's, it's like we have to, you know, help each other and to achieve this kind of like equality world. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that, you know, he's a male, he's a male director. As long as he's with us, right? He wants to, we want to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and Midi, from your point of view, sort of more or less, I guess, the same question, but from the other side, your, your filmography to date would not necessarily have lent anybody to think that, that Nina Wu, with its very stylized, noirish trappings and, and some of the influences that you've already mentioned, um, would necessarily be the project that you would do. So, so can you tell us, from your point of view, what, what are the continuations? What, in, in what way does it fit with or flow on from the rest of your filmography? Mm. For me, I, I always, I, I think I'm still young. Yeah, I still need to try to test. Yeah, yeah, like different kinds of um, films. Because for me, each kind of story should be made with different kinds of style or theory or cinematic uh, languages for, for me. Before I made uh, seven films, yeah, including documentaries and fiction, most of them made by very low budget, minimal crew, shooting days like 10 days or one week, those limitations have me to create something different, depends on the instinct, depends on my realistic life experience. But Nina Wu compared to the rest kind of all of my films is very different. But the thing of the film is the same. For me, it's about telling a story about a girl living from her hometown, isolated in the city, pursuing her dream. Yeah, I have the same experience in my life. When I was 16, I came to Taiwan for making a living, for changing my, my family, materials life. I was uh, alone, living in the city. Yeah, I haven't been before. So that's the same diaspora. And, and as Kashi said, I, I was raised by my, my, my elder sister and my mother. So we are, you know, women power family. <laughs> right. You're the black sheep of the family just for being a woman. <laughs> we'll forgive you. We'll forgive you. <laughs> so I, I think I may understand totally about female feeling. Yeah, that's why. And Nina you know, Wu for me at the beginning, right after I finished reading the script, I feel it's a human artist story. It's telling about a story, it's telling a story about the journey of female artists' creative mm -hmm. life. Because in the cinematic history, we watched many kinds of film telling a filmmaker's creative journey, but we haven't seen very uh, any kinds of film telling the point of view from the female artists, especially from the actress. Mm. For me, it's very interesting. I think especially uh, I, I saw I saw various various kind of visual in the script. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it would be a challenge for me. It would be a leap for me. It would be a try for me. As I have said, I'm still young. I have <laughs> tried. I have to try. I have to try. We're all still young, don't we? <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> yes, this is really interesting what you say as well. And, and Gushi, I'd like to get your, your take on this, There's, because I think one of the strands in the film um, that comes through very strongly is just this notion in general of performance. Of, of all the different ways that Nina Wu has to perform and not necessarily always when the camera is running. And I think that's one of the very clever things to me about what how the film is put together is that because you're never sure if you're in a fiction within the fiction or if you're, it, it makes you realize how much of the performance that we that you know we put on just happens every day. It doesn't necessarily have to be because we're on stage or in front of a of a screen. Um, and I wondered if I if 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 Kushi, do you have anything any sort of any thoughts on that on, on this idea of how you you can use a film to talk about and, and you use your status as an actress to talk about the ways that we perform in real life. Sorry, pardon, and can you can you repeat again because there is the <laughs> internet. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's no problem. Um, I'm just talking about in general about the the idea that um, as an actress, uh, obviously your your job is performance. But I think a lot of what Nina Wu uh, talks about is how the job of performance, certainly for a woman, but actually just for people in the world, is never done. And it doesn't matter if a camera is rolling or not, we're always playing a role. So I just wanted to, to, to ask you from the point of view of not only the scriptwriter, but also the actress, the star of the, of, the, of the film, how much that idea of performing in your everyday life um, informed what, uh, what, you, what you then gave us in, in Inawu. Uh, well, I think, uh, especially in, especially you know, being an actress, it's, it's especially on set, it's really performative, you know, uh, because, um, uh, because because sometimes you have you, you most of the time you have to get into the role, and then when you are out of the the, the set, and uh, a lot of crew, and then sometimes you know, uh, agents, and then a lot of people around around me and then it's and so it's really like I have to uh be careful of a lot of things yeah yeah I think there's a, a and, certain degree uh, that you have to kind of protect who you really are because you, you can lose it I would imagine in those situations yeah and it, you, you really need to be very careful and then not to be misunderstood by a lot of people so you really need to be cautious about what you act and what you say and then, uh for example uh, i would really want to work with a lot of talented directors right but sometimes it's uh if i ask them for their like private contact and it's really need it it, it, it it's really like it it's really like need to be careful that I really wanted to cooperate with them. And in, instead of being misunderstood that uh, I want to be closer in that intimate way. Right, yeah. yes. I mean, I think this is obviously one of the very big things that happens throughout Nina Wu. Um, there's, there's a very scathing uh, portrayal of the director-actor relationship, actress relationship here. Um, I mean, the, the director is is basically a bully and is is absolutely physically abusive. Um, uh, Midi, how did you feel about approaching those those sort of scenes? Um, and uh, I'm not going to ask you if if they were informed by personal experience. I'm sure that they were not. But um, but how did you feel about sort of portraying this idea that that we already we all somehow do still have in our minds this idea of the genius male director who must be allowed to do whatever he he wants in order to get the performance for me i i i think it depends on the personality because my personality especially during the shooting when I walk or I communicate with actor or actress, I I I always uh, how to say that I I always keep myself at their position to you know to to think about uh, the performance to share or to communicate. I I. But sometimes, you know, when you focus 
very deep about the artistic part, you may lose your tempo mm -hmm. or something, and people or actors or actress may misunderstood you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you know what I mean? So, because during the shooting, you always full of uh, press, you know, you, you always full of ideas. Your, your right brain may be very rational and your left brain may be very sensitive. So those kind of things put you to some place with, uh, how to say the mental problem maybe. Maybe mm -hmm. it's very short second. You, you focus too much about the things. Maybe only you see the thing. It's about art. Mm -hmm. It's nothing about a personal issue. So, mm -hmm. so after Me Too movement for me, I, how to say that, I, I always ask myself, did I do anything to any crew with an polite way? Yeah, like that. So it did lead to a little bit of soul searching on your part. Yes, yes, for me. But my personality is very soft. I, yeah, if you, yeah, if you ask any crew who work with me, I always, you know, lower my, my voice, mm -hmm. speaking very slow, explain my idea very clear, what mm -hmm. I want, how I want. And I asked her or him if she or he comfortable with what I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think sometimes we need to be very rational. At the same time, we need to be very irrational for our creative idea. Right, yes, I, I, yeah. I understand. And, and mm. what, what I think is very interesting in what you say there is that you're, uh, although, I mean, the, the character of the director in the film, I think is, is I mean, for me, unequivocally, I, I think he's detestable. Mm. Um, but you're actually talking a little bit almost about understanding him and understanding where that, that yeah. loss of temper and that rage mm. and that bullying instinct mm. comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, to, to sort of to, to skip out a, a, a little bit, it, it's, it's one of the, this, that aspect, like having in, in some ways sympathy for the devil, I suppose, yes. um, is one of the things that I think is so interesting about Nina Wu. And actually, I think also maybe one of the things that people found initially quite difficult. There, I mean, I think over, overall, the film was very positively received out of Cannes, but there were some, some more negative critiques of it. Yes. And those people, I felt, a lot of them seemed to have a, an issue with the, that, that complexity that you're talking about, portraying these things with a degree of complexity, not just the director character, but actually yes, yes. Nina herself. The fact that the way that the, the, the film uh, uh, pans out, I, I don't want to give too much away for those people who haven't yet mm. seen it, but, but the way that, that it, the, the climax that it builds to is actually a very um, fraught one. It's very difficult and it's very complicated. So I want to ask you, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe because she, you can, you can tell me what you think about this, but, but do you think that part of the reason for, for that, part of the, the, the reason that people were, some people were resistant to understanding the film's very complicated um, view of these issues, uh, was actually about the timing because because as I said we, you know we were in the infancy of the sort of of the Harvey Weinstein Me Too stuff and this film for me certainly it was happening you know in, in a theater like maybe a hundred meters away from some of those hotel rooms in which Harvey Weinstein committed some of his worst abuses so it all felt so close and yet this film refuses to be very straightforward and to be a simplistic sort of statement of solidarity or a statement and perhaps was that what what people were looking for at that stage 
And do you think that because we're now two years later into that process, maybe the film will play differently now? Um, well, yeah, uh, when I first read uh, some of the reviews in Cannes, I was uh, shocked by uh, some of the reviews because I feel like they couldn't understand what this film was about. And then I started, I started to think, how, how, why, why, why didn't they understand the, the, the this film? And then I, just like what you said, and then I started to think, okay, so perhaps it's because uh, it's still too early for people to, you know, get to know more about me too. And then perhaps what you say is right, but or perhaps people are expecting a certain Me Too film. Okay, so what kind of film? Are people expecting a Me Too film? With, okay, when you talk about Me Too, okay, what kind of film that is? Okay, a girl got raped, and then, and then in the end, she uh, runs to the occasion, and then she beat up the guys, and then the guy was put in jail, and then there probably, well, uh, there is a hope or there's a happy ending in the end. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's what they want to watch. But I didn't uh, write the film to try to, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want the film just trying to obtain the opportunity to draw attention from the audiences. I wrote because I felt like writing in, in that moment. I didn't, and then I didn't know that I really could have the opportunity to, uh, to make this film yet. And right. I just have this urge, you know, because I felt so strongly uh, emphasized uh, from those uh, victims. I've, I, I really want to express in the way uh, to express the PTSD experience. So this film is, is, of course, it's definitely, I think it's definitely a Me Too film, but from a uh, PTSD point of view. Right. I think mm -hmm. PTSD is even more uh, important in this film, but because perhaps, you know, the promotion strategy, you know, the, uh, the film production company, they, trying to tell everybody that, oh, it's a Me Too film. So everybody, you know, comes to expecting something uh, with, with what I was, was, was saying and with a happy ending. So a lot of reviews saying that, you know, why the girl isn't, you know, uh, isn't being strong enough, uh, isn't, isn't me, me Too is about, you know, women gather together, isn't about, you know, women fighting against each other, you know, uh, uh, for example, you know, the audition scenes. Um, I think we should be like more open to, you know, watch the film and to let it flow and to feel, you know, the, uh, what is, what the film's about. And then instead of waiting for something typical or, yeah, that's what I, I yes, figured yes, out I, after, yeah. That's, that's absolutely, that was certainly my take on it when I, when I saw it. And, and I think that what you're talking about as well is, is, um, is one way for me to broach this, this last question that I want to put to, to both of you, but, but I think there is a certain desire in the wake of great trauma and social trauma that, you know, a trauma that, that a large number of people experience to sort of, to want something that's quite flat and, and simple and that, that, that gives us a very easy moral. Um, and uh, I'm reluctant almost to bring this up, but I don't think that it can be avoided. If people are watching, certainly in the States, are watching Nina Wu this week of all weeks, um, I think many of them will have on their minds the recent uh, murders in Atlanta. And, and it's already shocking to me that we have to specify which mass shooting incident we're talking about here. But um, the, so the murders in Atlanta, which um, have created a, 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 an atmosphere or created a conversation which is long overdue um, and is stutteringly happening around the representation of Asian women, um, uh, especially um, in, in America, but, but in, in general, and about their, the exoticization, the sexualization and the stereotyping of, of Asian women. So I'm just wondering, and I'm not trying to ask you to solve all of the problems of the universe in one sentence, please, but if you could also, that would be great. Um, uh, but just what do you hope maybe that, that Nina Wu can contribute to that discussion? Uh... For me, yeah. For for me, for me, I I think for any kinds of tragedy, 
in the presence of us at different kinds of position, at different kinds of professions, we should contribute uh, into it with our different kinds of professional techniques. We are filmmakers, we should make films to tell the story, to reflect the reality, to reflect what we think. Nina, Nina Wu for me is a film about, of course, Me Too, but it's not only about Me Too. It's about, as I said, it's about a uh, uh, female creative journey is more, more important is about PTSD. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kashi, have you anything? Um, yeah, well, just like what I what we discussed and then what I say is that uh, the the Me Too movement finished yet, right? Not yet, right? The, th the things are still happening in everywhere. Look at UK and look at, you know, what I heard the news from uh, Turkey yesterday and violence is everywhere. Mel violence even everywhere and things are still happening and the, the fight is finished yet so that's why we uh, that there is no happy ending in the now it will be something fake you know to give people hope but actually in the whole world you know we still need to fight but yeah and then just like what uh dr media said and I just think of, you know, when I heard the news back in 2017 and after watching so many news, I feel so emotional and I feel like I want to be part of it. I want to, you know, uh, write down a hashtag me too in my Twitter. But I, and then I started to think, OK, what can I do? What can I do for for for, for to, to, to express, express my, my voice? And then I realized that I can I can I can write and act. I can act. So that's why I started to write the story. And mm -hmm. that's so in our is my contribution to, to uh, LGBT, LGBT community, to traumatize women or men, and also for those uh, Asian Americans and, and lots of people in the world. Absolutely. I think that's, I mean, it's a, it's a, a more somber note than I would like to have to end on, but I think, um, I think I'm being told that I have to end. Um, and it's, it is a very important one. And from my point of view, certainly, I think that Nina Wu contributes in the, in the sense that it provides us with this rounded, you know, complex female Asian character who, yes, is, has an incredibly traumatic thing happen to her her but is also a, a daughter is also uh you know a lover um and she also makes great dumplings which i need to get the recipe for. <laughs> I'm very excited about those um but thank you very much for talking to me and uh, congratulations i really think it's a fantastically uh um important film and a, and a really really challenging one in all the right ways so thank you for talking to me today my pleasure thank, thank you, you jessica, jessica. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.